many of us are not as knowledgeable as we should be in the area of intellectual property. And so I want to advise you to please ask him as many questions as you can. This session will also be videotaped for those exporters who were not able to make it this morning. And so he will introduce his colleagues when he comes as well too. Please join me in welcoming Richard. Right, as promised. Um, uh, they, they asked me to do two sessions, one for services and one for exporters. I had to tell them, I think we're starting almost at the same point because everybody doesn't know enough IP as they should. So that's how we're going to do it. We're going to start off with the basics of what is IP, the different types of intellectual property, and hear me using the acronym. And hopefully in that you'd see uh, where would it uh, fit your business or uh, where would it fit somewhere you would want to go? Because it may, there may be ventures that you're thinking about, but you didn't know what would you be in for. Uh, and, and we say this, we have a lot of creative people here, but we te our tendency in Trinidad is to give away our creative genius. Uh, we see it all the time. Uh, we are very generous people, I, I would say, because we give away a lot of stuff to the foreigners who then make more money off of it than us. So I hope that uh, inspires you not to make similar blunders. So just a, like I said, short outline. What is it? And hopefully you'll be inspired by the, the kinds of money you can make off of it. <laughs> uh, simple definitions. What is IP? Well, we, we always tell people who, who come to us, uh, they want to protect their idea. They want to protect a concept. And we simply tell them, listen, your ideas are useless as long as they remain in your head. You've, they, they've got to come out. You've got to build it. You've got to sing it, write it, compose it, invent it, uh, put it on paper, put it on, record it on tape, on a hard drive somewhere. You've got to do it. Otherwise, you won't be able to, 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 to lay claim to it or even apply for some of these rights. So that's why we say in IP refers to expressed creations of the human intellect. They've got to be expressed. Right? Uh, just a little bit on where, where, what is our local standing. The Intellectual Property Office is part of the Ministry of Legal Affairs. And just to put in a plug here, just because we're in the Ministry of Legal Affairs doesn't mean that IP is a totally legal issue. And Well, it's not for me, it's, not, it's for my corporate attorney. And I see one um, IP attorney here in the, in the audience. It's not just for them. It's for the marketers, it's for the inventors, it's for the scientists, the researchers, everybody who creates, this is for them. So we often say it's a combination of law, business, and science, because they all interplay at some point. And I hope you appreciate that IP is a means to an end. So we, we grant these rights. The, these rights are then used by the owners to improve their competitiveness, secure their business, chase off competitors, Make money, make money. That in short, and what we our other activities are in the support of that, as far as uh, opposition hearings and helping develop the the IP environment. Uh, that that's where the office gets involved with. But our primary function is to examine rights and grant the ones that are grantable. We often speak of IP as, as forming two major branches. I think many of us, especially at this time of the year, would have heard about copyright and related rights because the artists would have been complaining about the amount of piracy. And I understand there's also another brouhaha about collective management of rights and FET promoters complaining that people are, being, that people are coming to charge them just to play music at, at their own FET. And some people are going to raise another issue, their own personal experience with, um, say, um, their wedding, and how come I have to pay for my own wedding pictures? It's me in the pictures. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of things that we, we, we've heard about copyright, but we may not have appreciated all the integrities of it. And the other half of IP, the other branch is what we call industrial property. Just um, focus. Copyright and related rights 
relate to um, literary and artistic works. So many of us here uh, have are consumers of IP. So you, you hope you re realize too that IP is all around us. We consume, we make decisions based on it. Uh, some of us may realize that, hey, I create IP because at least in the show every morning, if you're a singer, you've been singing songs, just that you haven't recorded it yet. Right? I think there's this comedian, uh, Russell Peters, he's making a crack about Trinis. I don't know if you've ever seen that, 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 um, that skit that's Kitty did. That, tri that Trinis are just, well, about, besides our sing song voice, he, he's complaining about. They, he's sure that we all compose and soak tunes in his show as we, let's say Trinis are too happy, or just soak songs, just happy music that's coming out of you all. <laughs> so we compose stuff, art, movies, uh, writings, games. Uh, just to give you a, a more comprehensive list. Anything musical and artistic, software, sculptures, uh, architectural drawings, of course, ph photographs, uh, stage productions. And under our law, we, we include in the middle there works of mass as a, one of those collective works and derivative works because there's a lot of art and literature in, in, in the mass industry and music as well. So just, just keep that in the back of your head, anything artistic and literary. I, I'm, I'm leaving a copy of this, this presentation with um, Export TT, so I hope they'll be kind enough to share it. All right. They'll have to put it on a Dropbox or something because it's a big file. Right, so that, that's one, that's copyright and related rights. And a big difference between copyright and related rights and industrial property is that copyright is what we call, it, it arises automatically. As soon as you create a work, let's say you're bored already and you've been doodling on your program, this fellow talking, and so you made some drawings there, you've created a piece of art your rights have arisen automatically as, as soon as you've created it. And also they've arisen automatically in all the other countries which are signatory to something called the Berne Convention. So you don't have to come down to office and fill out any forms or pay any fees. Neither do you have to go to Russia to fill out any forms or pay any fees. Your rights have arisen automatically. Some countries have a registration system which, or a voluntary registration system uh, that, which they append onto their court processes, but it's not necessary to get copyright, okay? So you may, may have heard of the US Copyright Office where you can actually submit stuff and get some kind of certificate, but it's not necessary that they, it's not that they're giving you copyright, they're just giving you, so uh, it's almost like a deposit, proof, proof of deposit. And I know Jamaica has a voluntary copyright, a voluntary registration system some people want us to institute one in Trinidad, but that's another story. The, the, the fact is that it's not necessary. You have copyright right away. You can use that C in the circle, your name, and the year in which you created something. You don't need to come to us for permission to do that, okay? So let's keep that in mind. If you are creating an original work where you're sure all this stuff in it is yours, we come to that. Um, because we have a, a problem in, in our society do we hear a lot about um, plagiarism and people acquiring other people's works and changing their names or not quoting, not giving um, uh, accreditation or credit for where the quotation came from. And that brings me to, um, to, to some exceptions and limitations. There are some things which you cannot get copyright on and this is true for any kind of IP, you know, ideas, procedures, discoveries. When we say discoveries, things that you have found, not necessarily created. Raw data, this is unorganized data. Legislation, that is the government's decision to waive its rights in any of its legislative texts because it wants the public to have free access to the laws. And you can make copies of the laws once you, our laws anyway. Translations, and look at this one, political speeches. There's no copyright in them. <laughs> now, let's gonna get into related rights, because I said it's copyright and related rights. You have to appreciate that as you would probably hear 
in, our, in this season. There are people who sing the songs and there are people who write the songs. So the guys who write the songs are the composers. So they own the copyright in the composition. And some other person would perform the music. He has rights or he or she has rights in her performance. So there are people who are the, they say they're, they're the, the creative geniuses and then there are, there are other people who are the face or the voice. And there are many successful partnerships in, in music. And uh, sometimes they go sour, but that, that's when they expose all the underpinnings, like who wrote what and who sang what and who's the real genius. But the, the performers do have rights in their performances. Similarly, you hear, you hear this uh, nearly every major uh, televised event, um, Olympics, football matches, um, the IPL, Cricket League, the TV companies pay for the permission to broadcast the event because the, the promoters or the organizers, they own the event and all the media. In fact, if you go to some, some concerts, so I know Queen Soul has this rule, no flash photography, no unauthorized video recording because they control the venue and they can, they can dictate. Of course, people ignore them, but still, it's, it's, it's the rule, so I take off my flash. <laughs> they said no flash photography. They didn't say no photography, right? Um, but they, they control the venue, and they can dictate what you can and cannot record because they are planning to put out, hopefully, a DVD or a recording at some point, and they want to make sales of it. And if you record your own bootlegs, <laughs> they won't be able to sell. So I hope you appreciate, and I, I trust you're a, a good supporter of the artists and you've been buying your original CDs, correct? And not the unauthorized compilations. You can hang your head and shame yes, you know, you know who you are. <laughs> but that, that's the, the nature of related rights. So it's the performers, the broadcasters, the guys who produce the song recordings. And there's some humongous money to be made for broadcasting, broadcast rights. So um, these big events, FIFA and, and, and uh, Olympics, that's how they make their money. They sell the rights to some TV station who then tries to recover their, their money by selling advertising. Right? So that's the way it's supposed to go. I say, I say it's supposed to go because I've heard some events in Trinidad where the broadcasters want the organizers to pay them to broadcast. And I tell them, you have it wrong side. <laughs> you are supposed to be paying the organizers for permission to broadcast, not the other way around. Right, so we sp I think we're pretty familiar with the, the economic rights. The, these rights are, are there to, to make sure that the artists or the creators get back uh, the, a return on their investment because it costs money to put out a movie or a CD. Because if you follow the movies, especially the Hollywood movies, you'd, you'd get the figures after. And you know, they, 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 they love to uh, tout the box office gains. And then you hear, well, it cost 70 million US to make, but we, got, we, got, we made 120 million in the first three weeks. So you know, there's a, somebody had to put out some money up front and hope that the thing sells properly. There's another important uh, aspect, at least under our law. I say under our law because not all countries respect moral rights. And moral rights are, have nothing to do with morality, but they're simply the right to be identified, the right to be named as the author. So which is a, that comes into play, especially when you, we, we, uh, we are making quotations. You need to at least acknowledge where you got it from, at least, if you're quoting an, an, an excerpt. So there's a right to be named as the author, the creator, the right not to have your work distorted, not to ob the right to object to distortions or misuse of your work. Uh, an example is, um, which happened, I think, in an election gone, where uh, the owner of a certain song objected to his song being used in a political campaign because he didn't want to be associated with that party or whatever. That's, that's, the, that's the right of the, the author, the owner of the song. I, I know many composers have objected to their music finding themselves, find its way into, say, let's say, a, a soundtrack, soundtrack for a, porn, a pornographic film because they don't want to be associated with those types of films. So they say, you need to pull my music off of that because I don't want to be associated with that. And for religious reasons, uh, people can make objections. And, 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 but it's, that's their right as, uh, as the owner of the, the work. And this is retained after expiry, so even though 
the, the copyright on the Mona Lisa has long expired, hundreds of years ago. We still have to acknowledge that it was Leonardo da Vinci that painted it, even though he can't object right now, but still. These things can be waived, but they must be waived in writing. It's one of those rights that persist. For example, um, you, write, you write a soca song, congratulations, and Marshall actually gets to use it next year. And he says, uh, can you sell me the song? He says, sure. You sell him the song. So he, he owns the song, but you are still the composer. And you say, I want to be acknowledged as the composer when you're going to accept your award. OK? Written by? And if he doesn't want to do that, then he has to pay extra for that. <laughs> OK? So that's, uh, just be aware that there are economic rights and there are moral rights. And um, if the organizers wish, they can be, we can organize a separate whole session on just copyright and related rights alone. We can, we can get deep down into what kinds of rights are inside a copyright. Because copyright is not just one right. There's a whole bunch of little rights inside of there. Right to, the right for public broadcast, the right for reproduction, mechanical rights, translation, adaptations. There are a whole bunch of rights that go along. So it's not just copyright. It's copyright. Okay? Just keep that in the back of your head. It's not one thing. Right, industrial property. This differs from uh, copyright and related rights. The main fact that it's, it involves um, territorial rights. So whereas copyright and related rights uh, arise automatically, industrial property, uh, these are sovereign rights, they're territorial. You have to apply for them in each country you want them to be exercised in. So whatever industrial property rights you get in Trinidad and Tobago have no effect right next door in Grenada or Barbados or Venezuela. You want rights there, you have to go there and file for them. And that works both ways. That means rights, or industrial property rights that exist in, let's say, in North America, Canada, US, if they haven't filed for anything in Trinidad, that means they have no rights in Trinidad. And that's a, that has, so that, that, that has implications of what we can use or not use without permission. The door swings both ways. I'll get some more into that. Starting with, with, with patents. Uh, this covers like inventions, devices, gadgets. I work with some of mine. Let's illustrate uh, improvements on old technologies, uh, processes, chemical compounds. Um, <laughs> Technical solution to existing problems. And not necessarily a problem, or it could be a technical solution because you don't like the way the old one works. Because I don't think the iPhone solved the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you're familiar with the right flyer. Anybody who knows what this is? Aha. Uh -huh. I'm impressed somebody knows. I wouldn't ask you how you know. It's Viagra. The little blue pill. It's protected by patent. There the are patents on the drug. The drug is called sildenafil citrate, if you're into chemistry. Um, it, you know the story? It was in, initially invented to treat a heart condition called angina. And then doctors noticed a useful side effect. Yeah. All right. And you may be wondering about um, Gatorade. Gatorade is actually protected by about five or six different patents on the formulation. It is a specific formula. Uh, it was invented um, to solve a problem with athletes. Um, the story is, at the time, the conventional wisdom was that athletes should not drink water during um, sports while they're exiting themselves because they thought you'd get stomach cramps, etc., etc. Therefore, you should just run until you're exhausted and drop down. And then you get subbed. They'll substitute you. You should not drink water during. And uh, Dr. Robert Cade uh, thought that, um, he, he, this is at the University of Florida. He thought he's, uh, the reason why these guys are failing or falling down is because they're dehydrated and they've been losing electrolytes because you know once you perspire, you lose salt, electrolytes. And of course, they're, they're tired as well, they're low on muscle energy. 
So he thought, so if we can restore some of the salts and the, and the fluids and give them a little extra sugar, form of glucose, we can restore the performance. And it worked. He concocted something with sodium salts, potassium salts, glucose. It's a specific recipe that's supposed to mimic your body, uh, your blood chemistry. And it, it worked, and they were really mashing up the competition, and the competition was pointing fingers at them that they're using something weird in, that, in those coolers there, because their boys are, are lasting longer on the field. And the, the thing is that uh, if, you, if you ever drunk anything with, with um, potassium salts in it or potassium chloride, you know that it tastes kind of acrid. It, it's not as, it doesn't taste like sodium chloride, good old table salts. So it tasted awful, but the boys drank it anyway on the duress. And then the story is that Dr. K's wife um, advised him, well, let's put some lemonade in it. And the name of the team was the Florida Gators. And that plus the lemonade, and that's how they, they concocted the name Gator Aid. So that's the story. Short, short end of it is that uh, the University of Florida owns the patents, and they license it to manufacturers. And they get the straight royalties. They don't manufacture. They own the rights to manufacture. I want to start thinking about our, our intellectual property as we are very comfortable and familiar with real property. So we know about land, we know about cars, and we know about the, the things that we own, and we know how to buy and sell and trade them. We know we can lend somebody something, we can rent it to them, we can give it away, we can sell it outright or assign it. Or we can sell you at one price and sell him at another price. That is your right with your property. And so we need to start thinking about our intellectual creations as real property. And the same way we are comfortable with real property. And the same way, once you get an idea of the value of your intellectual property, hopefully you won't be giving it away as easily as you do right now. Uh, some of the criteria to, to get uh, patents anyway. Uh, no, the first one is novelty. And that simply means it's got to be brand new. And we say brand new in the whole wide world. And one of the rules we have on this, at least in, in our jurisdiction, is that it can't be older than one than 12 months before the date of filing. So if you're going to file something today, it cannot have been out in the public domain 12 months before. This has implications for people who are researchers who have written scientific papers or have in, uh, applied to say that uh, those invention promotion competitions. I2I, I, Nihus, Prime Minister's Awards. So your invention may have been put out in the public domain before you filed. In some jurisdictions where there, there's no grace period, they say if you put it out in public today, you cannot apply for a patent tomorrow. So you need to be very aware of what will be your plan, your business plan, if you're going to be exposing your technology prematurely. You need to be ready to run, as we say. Or the clock starts ticking once your, once your technology goes public. You need to be aware of that, very mindful of it. If you're planning um, product la launches and that kind of thing, and you, might be, you may not have thought about the IP until after. We ha at least you have 12 months in our jurisdiction and in the US and a few others to, to recover. In the European Union, they give you six months grace period. All right? And some countries, like I mentioned, have none. Novelty, right? So it's got to be brand new. It's got to have an inventive step. Well, it's got to be non-obvious to persons with average skill in that area of technology or a person with average skill in that art, as we see. So by way of illustration, most of us are sitting right now on um, four-legged chairs. So the state of the art, we could say that chairs have four legs, right? That's the state of the art. That's the norm. If you invent a five-legged chair, then you may be considered to be novel because Chairs have four legs. You have a five-legged chair. Congratulations, you're novel. However, a person who makes chairs would say, that is not inventive. It is, it is obvious to me as a chair maker. That's what we mean by non-obviousness. Your invention must be n not obvious to persons who know about that technology. So your five-legged chair on its own would, not, would fail the inventive step test. It will work. Unless your fifth leg does something that chair legs don't normally do. So if that fifth leg plays a tune or resorts your weight when you sit down it, well, that's, that's considered novel. Or not just novel, it's also considered inventive. 
So you pass that test as well. And the next test is industrial applicability. It's got to have application in industry. It's got to work. It's got to have a technical effect. Why we say that? Because people still file uh, inventions that don't work. They put thing, things together on paper, and then they try to file them. And it's the reason why at the IP office, for example, or any patent office, the examiners are scientists, engineers, chemists, biologists. So we, can, we, we, we know <laughs> if it will work or not. And, so, and there's no requirement that you come to, to the office to file with a, with a prototype. You don't have to have a working prototype in order to file an application. You can, if you can, once you can represent your invention on paper, a good scientist will be able to see whether it will work or not. Will it float? Will the chemistry work? Will the, mecha will the mechanism work? Yes, yes or no. And in some cases, we meet people who we tell them plainly, your energy flow doesn't balance. Something's wrong here. And then it says, no, it will work, it will work. And we said, say, okay, hey, what? You go and build one. And when they get it to work, come back and talk to us. And of course, we never see them again. Because the invention is flouting the laws of thermodynamics and science, and it won't work. So there's a requirement that your invention must work. And we have, um, I don't know if you know what this is. That's a, an artificial heart. Or one of the later generation, the, the newer models. I wouldn't want to find out if it works very well, but I'm told that it, it's, it's a lot better than the early generations. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Javik series of artificial hearts and all the trials and errors that the, the patients or victims experience. Here's our friend again. Go to Viagra. Uh, this car is here as a representation of, of um, you probably don't realize that you're driving a whole bunch of patented technology right now. If you have a modern car, you probably um, take, you pro it, I'm pretty sure the, the, the salesman did not s sell it on the patented technology. He just sold you a bunch of features and price. <laughs> and he didn't appreciate that there's a bunch of patented technology in that vehicle uh, from the, the steering system, because I don't know if you noticed, many cars have, have gone away from a steering column. So your steering wheel is not connected to the wheels anymore, you know. There's an electric motor and they're doing the steering for you. It's disconnected. Uh, the newer cars, it used to be that uh, I'm old enough to know when cars had the, there's a cable going from the accelerator pedal all the way to the carburetor. <laughs> there's no cable. The cable is, is electrical now. So it's electronic, it's electronic pedals. And pretty soon they'll move to um, disconnecting the brake itself. and will be electric braking. It's not, the, it's not there yet. What I'm saying is that there are improvements, improvements, improvements uh, to get greater and greater efficiencies to reduce the cost of production, to make the car stronger, safer, lighter. Um, if you have an electric car, you see a lot of technology. You notice the trend, shifting trend towards LED headlights and taillights. And I think now Mercedes-Benz, the S-Class has gone all LED. Not one bulb in that car. The headlights are all LED. As opposed to just um, uh, park lights. So there, there, there are also a lot of patents in the, in the manufacturing of these cars themselves. That's just a, by way of an illustration. Here's a less um, familiar area, industrial designs. Now industrial designs cover the ornamental aspects of, a, of an object. It could, it could be an a, a item of craft, handicraft, or it could be an item of manufacture. Uh, in our market, you may be fam very familiar. You're probably n you've been in consuming industrial designs all your life, or your children have at least. Uh, SM Jelly owns the industrial design on that chubby bottle shape. But you may not have figured out how come nobody has copied the bottle. Because they couldn't. Because they own the shape. So even, uh, I remember Solo tried to compete with them with the Solo little boy, and if you remember that. Um, but they had to use a different shape, which didn't quite have the appeal of the chubby bottle shape. And just to mention also, chubby, the intellectual property or industrial property is not uh, mutually exclusive. You can have more than one. So they own the shape on the bottle. They also own the brand, chubby, and the character. And they own also the copyright in the literature that's associated with the, the marketing of chubby. Uh, watches. Um, the famous iPhone, some would say infamous. In case you're wondering, most of us may have heard about that, that big patent case. Apple versus Samsung. 
and they accuse Samsung of stealing or infringing their patents. Well, that's how the U.S. put it across. What it was really is that, in, at least in the U.S. market, they call industrial designs design patents. So the main, the main uh, crux of that case is that they said that the app, the Samsung Galaxy series looked just like one of those iPhones. And of course, Samsung in their defense said, how can Apple own a rectangle with rounded corners? Well, it's not that alone. It's also the detail on the, where the button is and the size of the screen and the, vo the, um, the mic and the speakers. And all, it's all that involved in the design, but it's just how it looks. So you may notice now that the Apple retains the circle with a square in it, and Samsung has gone to elongated rectangles and for the, uh, the, um, the main button at the bottom. Small details, you might say, but that's what makes the difference with, with these technologies. Uh, shoes, it's very extensively used. Perfume bottles. Next time you go shopping for perfume or, or toothbrushes, see down here, you, and you see that array in front of you, ask yourself, will you ever find any two perfume bottles with the shape, shape of bottle? Very hard to find that because they want to be distinguished from their competitors. And some of the more aggressive manufacturers like, um, like Bulgari. Bulgari is very aggressive, at least in our market, even though I don't see them selling that much product. But they're very aggressive in the sense that they file all of their bottle designs down here in Trinidad to make sure all the other people can't copy their bottle designs. Whether they like Bulgari or not, they come up with some weird shapes that, <laughs> if you've seen the variety. Um, shoes, the soles of shoes, uh, the shapes of some of the shoes, uh, especially ladies' shoes, that's, that's a new area now. Christian Labouton, anybody? Um, embroidery, um, I forgot to bring the one on, on hijabs. If you're in that market, there's, there's, a, there's a local lady who's filed a whole bunch of the industrial designs on very on, ornate hijabs. So they're not simple scarves, they're very elaborate, lots of appliques, and they, they also, they're worn differently, slightly differently. So that's the kind of hijab you'd, you'd wear to, um, to weddings and special functions, right? And I don't know if, if you live in the Chagones area, you might know this building. This guy owns, he owns the industrial design of that building, which was initially put out there selling ice cream. But I think he had a problem with location. It's not a kid-friendly locale, so I think he's selling chicken and chips now. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. He owns the building. He owns the, sorry, the shape of the building. It's, it was a good idea, we thought, for, for selling ice cream. If he had a better location, that is something that could mean franchise. That's something to consider. If you own the shape, that means you can duplicate the shape. And that could have been his franchise. Let's say all his outlets are shaped the same. And you recognize them at a glance from afar without even having to see the sign. It was all part of your marketing. Remember, these, these things all support your sales and your marketing and your branding and your imaging. It's called intellectual property, but it, it works in the background there to keep your competitors off your skin. <laughs> this is a less familiar area. Uh, the arrangement of electrical components on a semiconductor or a circuit board. We use them all the time. We have them right now in our pockets and purses, on our, on our wrists. If you have Google Gear, or oh, not Google, App, Samsung Gear, sorry, Gear. <laughs> or if you have Google Glasses and all those things that, where they're miniaturizing electronics to fit into smaller and smaller spaces. And it's just that, the arrangement of electrical components in smaller and smaller spaces. And some of us may remember when uh, cell phones were this big. We used to have one. All that is antenna and all that is phone. <laughs> and it was called a cartel for good reason, because you couldn't carry it. It's not, it was not a personal cell phone. That's, you clip it in your car and you leave it in your car. But now we miniaturize them now. And touch phones or touch watches, you name it. Even your, your appliances, your fridge. Some of us, if you have the fancy fridges that have memory functions in them, that have electronic note boards on them. Right, so in, it's, it, these electronics are getting to everyday places that you didn't think about. In your shoes, if you have uh, the fancy footwear that, will, that have pedometers and pressure sensors that will transmit to you an app on your phone and tell you how much force you're exerting when you're running. Fancy and fancy stuff. 
uh, less obs uh, more obscure area, new plant varieties. Uh, this refers not to uh, any bush you find outside. This refers to bred varieties. So these are varieties where somebody has deliberately crossed something to create a new color, a new flavor, uh, disease resistance, drought resistance, uh, different production profile, flavor, you name it. All the, all the variety we value in our agricultural products uh, are arrived at by somebody somewhere in the background crossing a lot of older plants to get the newer ones. I hope you appreciate the hard work because it's very tedious if you've ever seen how it's done crossing pollen from one to another plant. When it grows, then you have to evaluate them, then you have to grow them out and then stabilize them. And it's a long process. I'm told the, the our cocoa industry in Trinidad represents about six decades of breeding work. What, that's why it's protectable, because if somebody steals one of the newer cocoa varieties that they have, you have 60 years worth of research just by stealing one, one seed, which is why these things are protectable, to stop that, well, to give the, the breeders um, some control over that. Remember, these are plant breeders' rights. Even though it's called new plant varieties, because the plants don't have any rights, huh? it's the breeder. So you may, you may know some of these, some of us, if you know enough apples and you've traveled and sampled real apples, because I hope you know that the ones that we get here are shipping apples. They're bred for thicker skin and durability and low senescence, so they take longer to rot so they can ship them all the way here. The, the, um, of course, even though better, the better tasting apples don't ship well, because they're softer, but they have a better flavor profile. And if you enter flowers, you, know, you may remember the time when anthuriums came in one color, red, or two colors, red or white, and then they started crossing, and crossing, and crossing, to get different colors, and then to get more than one color in one flower, and then to get disease resistance plus the colors. So you can appreciate there's a, there are thousands of back crosses that had to go on to get a multicolor flower with disease resistance. And that's how they've improved varieties and, and stayed ahead of the disease uh, that are rampant. Have you ever seen these? Purple carrots? They exist, you know, but they're just not, I don't think any importer is brave enough to bring them in because they figure people would not buy it. It would make a fantastic coleslaw, though, look at that. <laughs> and that's another thing. Um, there are many colors and variations of the varieties we consider normal, just that the market acceptability may not be may not warrant growing them or selling them. So that's part and parcel of, if you're a plant breeder, you need to appreciate well, what, what is the market I'm planning to file for these rights in. Are, is anybody gonna buy my yellow watermelon in this market? And I tell you no, because our trainees, we don't like yellow watermelons. We don't like yellow tomatoes. We only know purple, water, uh, purple eggplants. We don't know white eggplants. I used to grow them. Uh, how many of us ever saw white sorrel? Right. That's good to hear that you've seen white sorrel. <laughs> but there's, there's a lot more variety than we are accustomed to. But it depends on market acceptability. Very obscure area. This is one of Kavisha's specialties. <laughs> Geographical indications, where we say that there's, it's a, essentially a mark you to identify a good but the, um, that comes from a specific geographical area, and we say that the, the, um, there's a characteristic that's in those goods that is as a result of growing it in that area. So we can appreciate, most of us have, may know the story behind champagne, and so we know that champagne is technically sparkling white wine, but you can't call it champagne unless it, you use the champagne grapes, and grew it in the champagne region in France, and then use processed champagnoise to get champagne. You can get sparkling white wine from Chile, Argentina, Australia, California, Trinidad and all maybe, if you leave it too long. Uh, you can get it, but you can't call it champagne. Likewise, your cheeses, if you didn't get, did not get that milk from cows grown in the Parmesan region, you can, and, and and fermented it according to their standards in particular caves under certain humidity, you won't be able to call it Parmesan cheese. And likewise, your Roquefort cheese and all those other stinky cheeses the Europeans like. 
Yes, I had a sampler. Good grief. <laughs> but they're all unique be because of the soil characteristics, which it influences the type of what's in the grass, which then influences the qualities of the milk and how they ferment. And what kind of bacteria and fung fungi they use to ferment. All that comes into it to say, well, why is it different to all the others? Uh, if you're into whiskeys, you'll know the difference between your whiskey from Scotland, which is the only one you can call Scotch, because if you get your whiskey from Tennessee, it's called Tennessee whiskey or bourbon. And if you're into tea, you know, I met a lot of people who just, all they knew was Lipton. But if you're a tea person or teaist, you know that there's Darjeeling tea, which is Highland tea grown in the Darjeeling area in, in India. And people try to grow it elsewhere. They take the same plant and grow it somewhere else, but it won't taste the same if you're into teas. And if you're a coffee person, you know that there's a difference between Blue Mount, Jamaica Blue Mountain coffee, Colombian high, high altitude coffee, and Hongwing, which grows it. <laughs> and some people say they prefer, they prefer the low altitude. Harsh. You want to wake up? After the fat, Hong Wing. If you want a nice flavor, then you go for the, the other coffees. But these are tasteable differences. That's what I'm saying. And they're tasteable because of the regions they, came, they come from. Uh, we've been trying to pursue our local producers and, and, uh, and institutions to file for Trinidad cocoa. Because we, we grow the highest quality Trinidad cocoa in the world. It does fetch a price two and a half times up of the market price for the African cocos, the, the, the Foresteros and the Curios. But our people have not yet seen the wisdom in filing for these rights. That's another story. I can't get into here. But to say that it is worth filing for because the foreign entities, foreign manufacturers are using our domain name cocos to produce their goods. So if, you, if you're a chocolatist like me, you know there's a French company called Valrona that manufactures a chocolate called Grand Couver. And of course, guess where the cocoa comes from? Grand Couver in Trinidad. In fact, they, they buy nearly the entire crop that's available from that region. And they, and they said it like years. So you hear that, well, the, the 2010 year has been so loud, meaning that, and they, 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 because they can taste, there's a difference that that's tasteable year to year. Some would say the 2009 year was the best tasting year and they haven't gotten that back yet because of how the climate was. And the climate affects now the flavor profile in the beans. And if you, know, if you remember your history or how cocoa is fermented, this is what we're dancing the cocoa. And it's a process because our cocoa pulp tastes different to say African cocoa pulp. So there's a different flavor profile. We get floral notes and, and some flavors that the others have never heard about. So all of these things, these things factor into um, the differences that are tasteable and that people pay a premium for. Because you might be familiar with what a, a Charles chocolate costs, but a, a, a Grand Couver costs about nine euro. I think when we, somebody was selling them in, in Trinidad locally in, in West Mall uh, for about um, 90 TT. So what that? It's an expensive chocolate, but it's worth it. Eh? It really tastes fantastic if you're a chocolate person. If somebody really likes you and you're into dark chocolate, they'll give you a Grand Couver. <laughs> Trademarks. Right, so some of us may be familiar with, we know them better as brands or logos. Really, it's any symbol that distinguishes your goods and services from the goods and services of somebody else, preferably a competitor, so that they know the difference. <laughs> right, so you, you've been seeing, we've been eating and, and drinking brands all our lives, and we make choices, we buy things because of, we see the little, what we're looking for. Oh, it's got a a swoosh or whatever that you're looking for, or it hasn't got the thing that you don't want, some brand that you, you detest. So you ha all of us have our preferences based on, because we trust that brand and not that brand. And so the brands distinguish themselves by their different livery, and some of them have retained their livery for, for decades. See how this has evolved? It used to be a full guy in full clothes, now they've gotten to just the, the silhouette which looks good on car glasses. And, and if you know the history of Pepsi, you know that they've been evolving that, that mark. In fact, this is not the latest one, I think. It's gone, there's a slant in a white stripe now. They, they, they keep fiddling with it. However, I think Coca-Cola has not changed their, their, their script ever since. 
And you notice also that if you, if you contrast some brands, uh, you notice that, well, that they, they go through great pains to be different. And, and the idea is to be distinctive, not generic. So you don't want to just take a dot and say, well, my brand is a dot. My brand is a box. There must be something more to it to distinguish your brand. Uh, so you have, Angostura, you have brands that are recognizable without any words because they've gotten to that point in the, in the, in the as the marketers call it, top of mind. Right? Coca-Cola, little apple. The, your brand has got to be distinct. So it can't look like, you don't, you don't want it look, to look like anything else. And there's, so there's a test we call distinctiveness. Um, and is it capable of distinguishing your goods from the goods of others? So ideally, if you're, if you're going to launch another telephone um, company in Trinidad, the last thing you'd want to do is to have anything that looks like these existing players. You wouldn't want to be, because you want to be distinct from the others. And likewise, in, in any area of the trade, you're trying to distinguish yourself from your competitors. Otherwise, you're not, what are you doing to get the sales towards you? Um, this is the area that we, we, we advise people to, to take some care. If you haven't yet launched your product or your service, uh, take some time to, to design your brand or hatch a proper brand or hatch a registrable brand. Just to, just to distinguish. What we are talking about is not company registration. We are talking about trademark registration. You may say, well, I already have a brand. I never registered it, right? So you have an unregistered trademark. What you really want is a trademark that is registrable. Because that gives you a better defense in the, in the market against competitors or copycats. As, in fact, that's a conundrum in business. Uh, nobody may be harassing you right now because you're not yet on their radar. When you become famous, they'll be coming after you and they'll be trying to copy your products and services. And some maybe want to copy your brand. But you need to be sensitive to, well, before I hatch this brand and resist the temptation to be um, what we call load a tree, or use, um, use descriptive words like, um, well, if I'm selling microphones that, well, Mike is in a brand name. Trademark rules are counterintuitive to what your marketing people will see. Your marketing people will want to put best microphone ever. <laughs> the trademark examiner said, no way. <laughs> because you put load a tree words like best, you use the word microphone, which describes it's a microphone. Uh, so that's, that's, that's not what you need for, to get a trademark registered. You should also be con considering that right, if, if this is for exporters, where am I exporting to? What language do they speak across there? What is their slang? What are their social norms? What is the culture like? You know why? Because all these things can affect your, your branding or your color schemes in your products and services. Uh, we know, we, I know a lot of uh, local manufacturers who've learned the hard way, just even exporting in the CARICOM region to another English-speaking, well, we say kind of English, but there are some social norms where they don't like certain colors on food, for example. So you, that means you can't use these colors on any consumable item. Otherwise, they'll just ignore it. Some consumers want to be, they want a transparent packaging. Certain words mean certain things to some people. So, for example, and, and the, the trademark rules would, might differ from country to country. So we don't allow sound marks in Trinidad and Tobago, but there are other countries that allow sound. So in, if you know the, the MGM, the, that raw belongs to MGM. They own the raw. <laughs> if you develop a similar product, you may not be able to register the sound, the squish, or the whatever you want to, <laughs> in this market, but you may be able to get it in another market that, that registers sound marks. So, so just don't, um, if you're exporting, don't just lock yourself off from the possibilities just because of local trademark conditions. You need to ask yourself, what are the, what's allowable over there in your target market? Even though Tata Engineering is a massive firm, a massive Indian firm, uh, Ratan Tata, does the owner, he's a multi-billionaire. They own Range Rover, they own Jaguar. So it's not a small company. It's just that that particular brand it did, did not resonate well in this market because of our culture. 
So it didn't sell very well. Mitsubishi made a similar er error with the Pajero SUV. Somebody did not tell them that in uh, South American slang, Pajero is not a good thing to call people. You can go and look it up after. No, nobody wants to be called a Pajero. That's why in, this, in the South American market, they have to market it as a Montero. You can call it a Pajero in an English-speaking market because we don't know any better. So when you go to the airport and pick up your South American colleagues and they're wondering, why are they laughing at your car? Now you know why. <laughs> um, there's a, a French dairy company, Kiri. I think they have some of their products. Baby Bell is one of their sub-products that they sell in price. Mart. These little cheeses. They do cheeses, cream cheese and that kind of thing. I said their brand is Kiri. That's fine. It's, ha it's harmless in French, harmless in English. They learn otherwise when they try to export it to Iran that Kiri is a bad word. I don't say bad word. It translates to male genitalia. Right? So they had to change it to Kibi to sell in Iran because then you know, you're going to create problems for your marketing and your sales later. So please consider before you, um, you invest in marketing and, and packaging and all those things because I've, I've had manufacturers come to us after Nice packaging. Can I protect this? With and I say, well, it's, it's, not, it's not new. You know, if you change this and this and this, it could be new. Well, too late because I already have a warehouse full. He ordered it already and he had a warehouse full and he couldn't change it. So I said, well, when you finish that stock, you could come back and, and register the one you really want to protect. Because, and it depends on well it sells, of course. Just to let you know, too, there are some, some brands or shapes that have come so famous, like the Coca Cola bottle, that, that contour, the contour bottle, is now a trademark. So it's not just Coca-Cola, the brand, Coca-Cola, the script, Coke. They also own that shape. So if somebody tells you you have a Coca-Cola shape, you have a trademark shape. <laughs> <laughs> the Google Baby, that, like I said, this is just an example of brands that, that don't need uh, explaining. Uh, you have to consider, too, you may have multiple products and, and offerings. And you, you may want to consider that I might have a, a head brand and a bunch of sub-brands associated with it. And it could be part of your marketing, marketing campaign to have, well, have your sub-brands kind of related to your head brand. So you know, if you know Nestle's strategy, for some, in some markets, um, Nestle is the head brand, and then you have what, Nescafe, Nesquik, or some pun on, on Nest, right? That, that's, that's fine. That, that's, that's one of the strategies um, some, some manufacturers use. Uh, of course, it depends on what these words are going to translate to. So a lot of manufacturers do a lot of research, a lot of homework, before they hatch a brand, because they want to make sure that they don't have to change the packaging midway through production, which is costly. Right, trade secrets. This is the easiest one of all. How to, keep, how to, how to get a trade secret? Keep it a secret. No, that's where the science is. How do you keep it a secret? Now, most of us are familiar with these products. Of course, you know the good old secret herbs and spices, KFC recipe. Of course, you know Coca-Cola, secret recipe. Angostura, secret recipe. I bet you didn't know mango chili. This is manufactured by KC Candy. It's called mango chili. It's supposed to taste like, in my opinion, a half-ripe Juni mango chow with pepper. Supposed to. And they said it took a long time to develop that flavor because the flavor people didn't know what mango tastes like. They didn't know what a chow was. They didn't know what juni mango was. So they had no idea where to start. <laughs> but the, uh, I think there's another one called Listerine. Listerine is a trade... Sorry, Listerine was a trade secret. The nice thing, though, is the manufacturers still have to pay the owners of the secret, the royalties. You know why? Um, this is something to consider when you're writing contracts. <laughs> they wrote something called a perpetual contract. A perpetual, there's a perpetual agreement that no matter what happens, you will continue to pay this family a royalty prorated on, on your sales. They tried to get out of it when, when, the, um, when the secret went public. And the judge ruled that is not a condition for not paying them their royalties. So they, that family's been paid to this day for, <laughs> for a secret that is public. But one, one thing I want you to, to look at is, is 
If you, if you think that your product is worthy of a trade secret, you have to ask yourself, who knows the secret? Who's privy to it? How do you control your staff? Uh, are the staff bound by contract? Are they, do they have access to the recipe? I know uh, companies that are, that are very fastidious about keeping their secrets and they, they go through some great pains so none of the temporary staff will ever get to mix the secret sauce. If the head chef cannot come to work that day, she'll phone in first, put ketchup and mustard together. And no secret sauce today if, if she's not at work. I mean, it happens. You have to ask yourself, is it worth losing that recipe just to keep sales going for, on that day? Uh, I, how many of us bind our staff or our partners with um, contracts and non-disclosure agreements and non-compete agreements? In Trinidad, we are a very friendly society, very easygoing, until something bad happens or until somebody starts making more money than you. Then there's a problem. So it's to consider because we, we, we have met companies here who have wanted to go and sue the head chemist because they allege that the head chemist stole their, their street secret and putting it out in public. And we simply ask, did you have a contract with us forbidden that? No. Uh, who else knows the trade secret? Well, 300 ex-employees. You have no trade secrets. If you notice, the, the unique thing with these, these they're all recipe-based, right? So you can't get a trade secret. Let's say you invent a nice little torch like, like mine. It's like, right, I'm not, gonna t I'm not gonna get a patent. I'm just gonna keep it a secret. What do you think is gonna happen? Some firm in China is gonna take this apart and reverse engineer it. That's it, reverse engineer it. So these things are reverse, they can be reverse engineered. It's difficult to reverse engineer a recipe. Uh, that extends like, to also to um, uh, automobile tires. It's, ver it's a very competitive area between Michelin and Yokohama and Goodyear, and everybody has a, has a proprietary recipe. Now, anybody who's a, any, a good organic chemist knows that you can just take a sample from each tire, stick it in a machine, and get a profile of what's in it. But what you don't know is how they put it together. Likewise, how they put it together is very specific. There's a strict methodology for all of these secrets here. If you have ever baked a cake, how many of you know how to bake? <laughs> You'll know that you can't just take the list of ingredients, eggs, flour, butter, and throw it in a bowl, and stir. You'll get biscuits, right? You know that there's a, you're supposed to fold in things piece by piece, fold butter first. You can't just toss everything in. And, and most things that can be trained uh, with a trade secret have a specific sequence in which they're put together. Of course, it works better if you have multiple ingredients because somebody did come to ask us, well, I have a trade secret. How many ingredients in it? Two. So you know it's either this one first or that one first. You can't keep that one a trade secret. So it's got to be a complex um, formula. Uh, somebody... Somebody asked, suppose, um, suppose somebody jumped out and said, I have, I have solved or cracked Angostura's secret. And that happens every year. Somebody jumps out and says, I, I, I know what's in it. Will Angostura um, go out of business? Well, first of all, Angostura wouldn't even acknowledge you. The last thing they'll do is acknowledge that, oh, you got me. Sorry. That's it, that's it, yeah, that's it. They'll never say that. They'll just say, eh. Another joker. Try again. And, and that's, it, that's, it, that's a gamble with, with, with any trade secret. You're taking a gamble that the market won't figure you out. Because they had the, oppor they had the opportunity 164 years ago, I think, to get a patent for it. But a patent requires full disclosure. So if they had gone the patent route, they would have had to list everything and how they put it together in order to get the patent. And of course, that would have just given them 14 years at the time. Nowadays, it's, just, it's 20 years. So it's a, it's a trade off to consider. Can you manage the secret or not? Because the decision you'll have to make before you get to production. Huh? Uh, production. Um, hopefully, you've been inspired and said, right, I'm going to go after some patterns and start going through my invention closet. You need to consider a few things before because it's not just, remember, the IP is a means and end. And part of that end is, is, is your invention marketable, and there's a cost to getting your invention, you need to ask yourself, is your, is your and this, this is a series called The Seven Deadly Sins of the Inventor. We got it from the European Patent Office, and they allowed us to use it with kind permission. 
And so some ideas or solutions are simply too complex. They're more complex than the problem merits. So just to let you know, it's a nutcracker, really. So he's got this gigantic machine to crack nuts. It will work. He will get a patent. Will he sell any? Very few. Because it's, it's overkill. It's over-engineering, as we say sometimes. This, this is the major failing of a, a lot of um, potential inventions. It's not kept a secret until they file and they, they talk about it. Either they inadvertently talk about the secret or they put it in the papers. You know, wouldn't, wouldn't believe how many inventors come at me after they published an article and, come, and they bring the clipping. Have you seen my... And, I said, <laughs> and you just tell them, well, the clock has started ticking. You have to be able to move real fast. <laughs> in one year's time, they get these, a number of things done. And in, in one case, one guy locked himself out of the European market at the time. And he was so horrified when he realized what he had done. He had to go and reinvent. He had to do over the invention to, to put himself back into the novelty stream again. And this is another area where most inventors fo fail. I can tell you, based on my stats, nine out of ten inventors that come to my office, local, are not new. You won't believe how many people don't use Google. Because sometimes we, we use Google and we make one pass and we find, the, we find the product. We find it on Amazon, we find it here, it's on sale already. So obviously research, research, research. Before you commit to manufacturing, etc., check and see has it been done already. That, that's the simplest thing we, we can tell you. Um, one guy came to us after saying he spent 13 years developing a product and he was seeking government financing. We made one pass and we found the earliest solution was done since 1947. And the technology had moved on since his, his level, way past. So nobody wants his level of technology anymore because we, we, we don't use that again. Uh, I felt so sorry for the fellow, but there's nothing we could have recovered because it was way past <laughs> still, you know? But do, you, do your homework. Um, one of the areas we tell you, don't just rely on Google. We, we, also direct people to the pattern databases because most um, solutions, there are many solutions that, that, are, that are done as patents, but they never get to production for, for various reasons. Cost, guy didn't have enough money, nobody wanted to buy it, whatever. Uh, and, they think, and you think that it's not, it doesn't exist because you're not seeing it on the shelf. But it may exist in the, liter in the literature in the pattern databases somewhere. So that's one of the places we advise people when you're doing your literature survey um, to check the patent databases. Or you can come and ask the office because we do these searches for you. Uh, you need to think the problem all the way through. Um, I mean, this is just an easy one, but I can tell you we have patents for, I don't know, every time you, you travel on a plane and you're sitting through the safety briefing and they tell you how to put on a life jacket, and I don't know if you told yourself, what I really need is a parachute. If something is going wrong in the plane, I don't need a life jacket. <laughs> I need a parachute. And one guy thought, well, how to make parachute? Well, if you've ever, you ever gone skydiving, you know that putting on a parachute is a complicated process. It takes you about know, five minutes just to clip it on. And you know, if you're trying to jump out of a plane, that's not enough you know, time. So one guy thought, I'll make it simple. And he built a parachute attached to a helmet. So you just strap on the helmet, jump on the plane, and pull the cord. He got a patent on it, but he hadn't considered the problem fully. What happens? You pull a cord on a head, right. Your head will reach safely to the ground. <laughs> you didn't think it all the way through. <laughs> Nobody wants it. This is a marketing issue. You may have a clever idea, but if you can't sell it, you have something on sale, you'll be, you'll be just as poor. <laughs> this is a real invention. This is not made up. There's, there's something called, there's a pattern on three-legged patios not invented by men, mind you. I know you all thought some man invented that. Yeah? Um, two women invented this. And they thought this would be fantastic. It solves the problem that if I get a run in my stocking, no problem, I'll unroll the next one and put it back on and I'm back in business. What they never considered is, um, well, I can tell you they never sold a single one because they didn't consider, well, where do you stash the extra leg? You, you, and ladies, you know, there's no way you can roll that up. There's not going to bulge in a bad area. It's going to bulge somewhere that you're not going to be happy with, right? So needless to say, they didn't think the problem all the way through. And 
it might have seemed like a good idea to them, but nobody else thought so. And that's another aspect of, this is not IP, but that's marketing really. Uh, we said this already, I think. This is a repetition. Let's <laughs> see if it's kept secret. Um, unless, and we've heard, with, we've dealt with enough partnerships already. You can, IP can be owned in partnerships. You need to know that you can trust your partner. You may need to approach uh, product development specialists. So you may need to go to an engineering firm. Let's say you may need to approach career or somebody. And what we advise people to do, seeing as you don't have any IP yet, you may need to en engage a... Uh, something called a non-disclosure agreement, a non-compete agreement, a non-circumvention agreement, essentially a see and don't touch agreement. I'm showing this to you for you to help me develop something. You must promise not to steal it. Okay, sign this with and then we'll talk. That, that, that is doable. That's actually one of the safest ways you can, because you may need to get help because you, you may not have an engineering branch in your office, but you need to get help from an electronics person to manufacture something or the, um, if it's a food product, you may need help from some lab to uh, perfect it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the, the, because if you don't have those safeguards, and we are amazed at how many uh, local uh, inventors or producers go to help from an, another competitor. So they show the product to another competitor and ask for help. And I can, tell, I can read the script for you. They say, that's a horrible thing, I'll never sell. And of course, you know the story, next thing you know, your idea is on the market. Um, inventors need to, or producers need to have a realistic idea of the value of the invention. Especially this, this comes in if you are uh, an inventor who licenses. So you're not into production, you're licensing to somebody. And you may think this is the greatest thing ever. I want $10 million for it. I'm not joking, I'm not exaggerating. That's, that's the kind of numbers people just spout. Or I want half of all sale or royalties meaning that they want 50% royalties. And they're not the manufacturer, they're not the producer. Uh, so you need to know what is the going rate, because if you approach a, a manufacturer with that attitude, they'll just tell you, well, negotiations are off, because they want to know that you're a reasonable person. <laughs> I can tell you royalties t tend to be in the, in the single digits, huh? percentages. If you've ever seen royalty figures, it's like you're looking at 3%, 5%, 6%. You very rarely would ever see a double digit royalty. And because you're hoping that the, the, the product will sell on volume. So one of the best stories we know is that the pull rings on, on soft drink cans, Coca-Cola used to pay one cent per can. You think that will go out? Right. More than. So that's, that's a combination of the, the inventor being patient, not greedy, and just know that once this product moves, I think there's a similar story with, with the, the in, one of the inventors of the ATM. I remember that, that story. The ATMs had crossed 1 billion transactions worldwide. And they asked one of the inventors, what do you think of your contribution to the financial sector? And he said, I wish I had a different royalty agreement. Because he took a lump sum, I think. That's the story. Because at the time, it didn't seem like a popular idea. Because at the time, the mentality was everybody wants to go to the bank with a passbook, and nobody's going to stand up in front of a machine to get money. That wouldn't sell. You see, crystal balling. He, ne he never thought that this would have taken off across the wheel. And then he thought, you know, if I'd even taken half a cent per transaction, because the bank charges you, what, 25 cents or something like that? Uh, let's come back to these rights have exceptions and limitations. Uh, some of us may know some of these numbers. Copyright lasts the life of the author, and up to 50 years after his death. That plus 50 years is post-mortem. So your, your estate can own your IP. Uh, just remember, just like how you put, probably put in a will, your, your house and your land to your kids, you can put in your will, your patents, your trademarks, your brands, to your, your survivors, your estate. They, they are they're mortgageable, they're willable. Think of them as real property. People take out mortgages and, pat and patents. Now, our market is not a well-developed financial market, so I don't, you cannot yet go to the bank and say, I own the chubby bottle design. Can I have a loan against that, please? Not yet. <laughs> Trademarks last 10 years, but they can be renewed indefinitely. So like the Angostura brand has been going on and on since. So we have to keep the rec those very old files, 100 and something years old. 
going because it's still, it's still a live mark. Patents last up to 20 years, and after that, there's no renewal. It's, it's public domain. That's very important, these expiry dates, because that's how we have an, a generic pharmaceutical industry. Uh, this government will not be able to, or any government will not be able to run CDAP based on paying brand name, for brand name drugs. And generic drugs arise when the patent expires or has not been filed in Trinidad and Tobago. That, so we don't have to buy the brand name. Some drug stores, you, they'll give you a choice. You can have brand name or brand name price or generic price. Some people have different experiences. They say, well, the brand name will be better than the generic, but that's, a, that's another story. The drug itself, is, is, in that case, is not under patent. Industrial designs last essentially five years, but can be renewed twice. So you see five plus five, 15 years in total. New plant varieties, depending on if it's a tree or not a tree, it's 18 years or 15 years. Uh, geographical indications, presently there's no expiry date on them. That's something we want to change because it can't stay that way forever and ever and ever and block people. That's something that has to be amended. But that, that's, that's the, it's not universal, but this, this what you're seeing here is uh, in the ballpark for most countries. So most countries, I can tell you, will have 20 years of patents. Some countries may have life of water plus 70 or 75 years. It differs. Designs, you may see some countries may have just 10 years. And plant varieties, you may see 20, 25 years. So the period changes. It's good to know well, what, what am I getting into. Uh, as this is for exporters, you need to consider, well, as I mentioned before, these are industrial property rights. So if you need to get these rights just to trade in CARICOM, that means you have to go and file them in CARICOM. Uh, most of us in the, in the Caribbean are members of something called the Paris Convention for Industrial Property, which gives us one year after showing off your product in Trinidad and Tobago. You have one year to file it in a, a neighboring state. That's something to keep in mind, these timelines. Uh, IP is very time dependent. You have to be. You have to have a. a you need to have a, a market plan, a marketing plan. As soon as you hatch your idea, like, okay, at what point am I going to release, and how fast am I going to go to the other markets? Because I have the clock ticking to, to to get my trademark, whatever, in say, Jamaica. That means you may need to be prepared to file simultaneously. As soon as you release product here, you start contacting your attorneys in Jamaica to file at the Jamaican IP office. Or before the Beijing in Barbados is the corporate affairs and IP office. But you have to employ attorneys over there to see about these things for you. So that's the Paris Convention. That's for all industrial property. For patents, there's something called the Patent Corporation Treaty. That exists, that's a filing system. It doesn't grant an international patent. Uh, most of the Caribbean are party to this. I say most, except Jamaica, Haiti. Jamaica and uh, Guyana. What it allows you to do is to file one application in Trinidad and say, I want to go to all these other countries at the same time. So you don't have to necessarily run around. And you give, it gives you, in, under Paris, you had 12 months. Under the PCT, you have up to 30 months, which you may need if you are crossing language barriers. Uh, I had an inventor who had to file an electronic device, and he had to blanket. Taiwan, South Korea, China, because if he didn't blanket those guys, they would copy him, they reverse engineer him, and put him out of business. So, but it meant that he had to get eight different oriental languages translated, which added to his costs, and it, it costs, that added up to like half of his total expenditure for getting those patents filed overseas. So you need to consider in advance, while you're hatching your brand, like, um, where am I gonna go? and start adding up the, the, your potential expenditure to, su to support your brand. These are the things we have in place right now. On the drawing board, we have, we, are, we, are, we propose accession to something called the Madrid Agreement or the Madrid Protocol. This is for the international registration of trademarks, which is even better than, the, it looks better than the PCT, meaning that you, you cut out the lawyers. <laughs> you can file one application, but once we have that up and running, you file one application at the IP office here, and it goes to how many other countries, office to office. 
no middleman. All the others require that, but you have to hire an attorney across there, and then they file it for you. You can stay here, and it goes office to office. No attorney. <laughs> Except the ones in the office. That, that's going to be hoping that it's going to come on stream this year. That will make it much easier for you to file your trademarks abroad. Similarly, there's something we are contemplating called the Hague Agreement for the International Registration of Industrial Designs. It works the same way. You file one application at home or wherever, and you designate a whole bunch of other countries that you wanted to go to. That is a little further down in the pipeline. I mean, we may not get to this year because they're still chewing on trademarks right now. There's, there's, there, there's legislation uh, being amended. It's supposed to come to Parliament soon, this, this quarter. This quarter, which will make this thing happen. So those are, those are the upcoming options that will hopefully, don't, don't worry, they'll be fully announced and maybe we could do a session on, on Madrid filings for Export TT at some point when, when that comes on stream. Okay, let's uh, quickly, um, all of these rights, they are means to an end. They're not ends in themselves. I, I, I feel I have to repeat that because we meet enough inventors who come and show us their, their patent certificates under glass. I tell them that's an expensive piece of paper you have there. You need to be working it. You got the rights to do something because these rights, cost, they, they, these rights co are costly to maintain because you have to pay a fee to keep them in, in force. So you need to be working these, using these rights to your advantage, essentially making money as a result of them. Um, they're there to spur innovation. And I want us to consider a flip side the use of the patent system, for example, or industrial designs. I mentioned before that if somebody has a US patent and they don't file it in Trinidad and Tobago, it's considered free technology in Trinidad and Tobago. Once we don't export the products to the US, we can export it to Grenada to Brazil, wherever it's not enforced. It's not an illegal system. That's actually how the generic pharmaceutical industry works. The, we, the manufacturers map where is this drug protected and where is it not, and that's where you sell the generic version. So if I can offer one to you, there's a, there's a patent on production of synthetic diamonds. The entire technology is there in one patent. It reads like a shop manual. All you need is electricity and methane gas. Tempted? It's online, it's free. <laughs> if you have the technical wherewithal, help yourself. <laughs> but the, um, the owner of it, the, the, there's a company called Apollo Diamond, and they're making synthetic diamonds. These diamonds are not inferior. They are flawless because they have no impurities in them, which is why the De Beers and the real diamond guys, sorry, the natural diamond guys were complaining. They shouldn't be allowed because they're making flawless diamonds any color you want. You can customize these. Say, what's the color of my eyes? Okay, and they'll dope it. <laughs> and you can get color diamonds. Fantastic tech. And they're not inferior. They're just as hard as real diamonds. And all they do is they run electricity through <laughs> some of them. Uh, methane gas, some of them use a uh, chemical vapor deposition. Um, some of them grow the diamonds. The tech exists and the tech is patentable. It's patented, sorry. Of course, the ultimate purpose I said is already to make money, hopefully. Just to give us some, some ideas, the kind of money flows around with IP. These, this is, these are brand values from, from um, last year. This, this is a study, this is a study is done every year by a firm called Interbrand. You can look this up online. Just ask for best, if you Google best global brands. And I will show you the top 100 brand values. I emphasize brand value. That number there, these numbers here are in billions of US dollars, so the brand alone. So this brand alone, not the company, not the cash and bank, not all the other hard assets or intangible assets. It's just that, that asset, 98 billion. So we, we kind of bet that this year they'll cross 100 billion. They when I say they, Apple and Google jumped out of nowhere because uh, Coca-Cola was the number one brand for what? 10 or 12 years uh, at around 73 billion and then creeping up, creeping up. And these guys just leapfrogged. Within a sp in the space of four years, they came out of nowhere and just jumped over them in brand value. And when you ask yourself, if you know these companies, how much plants do they have? Any, if any accountants here? How many, how many brick and mortar assets do you think they have? Next to nothing, Google has one campus. What they own, though, they own a lot of tech. They own intangible assets, not 
physical assets that deteriorate. And if you look at the profile here, tech company, tech company, beverage, tech, 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 food, tech, tech, or transportation. And it's worthwhile, uh, um, I mean, we could talk a whole lot of brand strategy just looking at that top 100 brand listing because then you, it's very revealing to you. You know this here? This tells you that Toyota is the most valuable automobile brand in the world. It's worth more than Lexus, it's worth more than Mercedes-Benz, than Porsche, than Ferrari. Something to consider. Why, why I put that up there is because at some point, in hopefully, if your business endures, you may realize that at some point your business name could become more valuable than the rest of the assets in the business. If hopefully there's a reputation to back it up. If you, if you guys have studied any business, you might have read Peter Drucker at some point, the late Peter Drucker. But he made it so, an interesting uh, statement here. I was like, see, see, your purpose is to create customers, and you have two, two and only two basic functions. It says marketing and innovation. He said, everything else you do is to cut costs. Think about it. Marketing and innovation create wealth. When you innovate, you get some new ideas, and then you need to, it, there's no point having a new idea in a corner. You need to tell the world you have the new idea. And that's how you look and see how, how, how any of these manufacturers, how they tout their new products. Uh, Gillette is an interesting one. So it's been adding new, more and more blades. So it was a single blade, and then they came with the twin. So it's two blades. And then they come with the triple blade Mark III. And you know the arms race. They're going to come with four. And Schick came out with five. And just now they're going to have a blade this big with twin. <laughs> So they have to, it's a, some of them become an arms race after a while. Some to consider. I, I said at some point you can consider your, 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 your brand or your intangible assets may eventually be worth more than your tangible assets because this is the profile. And it, sorry, it's not so clear here. In the 70s, most of your, your company's value was in your, your tangible assets, brick and mortar, cash and bank. And a little bit was in the intangibles, which the accountants may have just simply written off as goodwill. The market like you. And this is based on, uh, on market value. The trend now is that most uh, companies with, where they, they, their values and their knowledge assets have very little brick and mortar assets and a whole lot of intangibles. Uh, the guys who are writing software now who, who just app firms, it's just a guy in a little room, and he, one PC, one laptop, and he writes games. So you know this, the Flappy Bird story. Were you all horrified at that story? He was making from that game alone 50,000 US per day in advertising because he released a free game, a free game, but it sold advertising as the model. 50,000 US a year, I, I did the maths, 18 million US per year, and he walked away from it. He's not scrunting, eh? he has other games that he's making money off of. Yeah, don't, don't feel that he's been a martyr, you know. <laughs> but these are, that, that's a trend now. So there are little guys who wrote a funny little game called Angry Birds, and next thing you know, Angry Birds has been merchandised everywhere. So they own the software for the, the game, then they own the characters, the trademarks, they own Angry Birds, and they own the different um, names of the birds. And you, if you have children like me, it's Angry Birds all over your house, you know. Uh, and all the merchandising that goes along with it. So something to consider when you have one of these hits, and a lot of that is, is, is underpinned by strong IP rights. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do it successfully without being swamped by the competition. Uh, so it's a, consider how you structure your business and your... And, um, IP as collateral. This is, um, this is the future here. This is not Trinidad. <laughs> IP, when can you use your intellectual property as collateral with our financial system or our banks? This is, this is, this is a, a futuristic scenario. This is actually a scenario in foreign uh, markets. I put it up here for your consumption because if you're doing business in a foreign market, you may discover that your IP could have value over there, where if you're doing business, somebody may be able to put up a loan against your trademarks that you've registered in that country. 
The emphasis is that if you don't do the IP thing and get the rights, you have nothing to trade. You have nothing as collateral. Just keep that in mind. I had some examples. I won't get into this. This is, this is very hard wrought information because people don't tell you how much they borrowed. Because <laughs> you see how old the data is. So once upon a time, Disney put up corporate in his vast collection of movies at the time as collateral, and they secured a $400 million loan, just US million, by the way, against it. I don't know if you know any of these companies here. Oh, let's look at Calvin Klein. Calvin Klein is a good example. How many brands do you think Calvin Klein owns? A handful, a literal handful of brands, CK and Calvin Klein. But they put up that on, they put that on the block. And they secured um, 58 million against it. And you see some, some companies here that the way they put up the assets, the intangible assets as collateral, not the building. Because the market across there is mature enough to recognize that these brands have value. Suppose Nestle had defaulted on its, um, its Nescafe trademark. Not a problem. They'll, t they'll shop it around and say, that company in China, you want to buy this? And as far as you know, you still get in Nescafe. It's just that they didn't know it's manufactured in China now because China owns it. And you might know the story, but those of us who know the Squeezy story in Trinidad, Squeezy used to be manufactured by Lever Brothers. They gave up the brand. The brand was then picked up by Answer Chemicals. So as far as some consumers are concerned, Squeezy is back. As all the concerned, Squeezy is back. And they rush it. It's, it's what the market thinks. Uh, this, the market doesn't know where it came from. It doesn't know that Squeezy is back. At the bottom here, I don't know, if, I don't know what your age is, but um, I don't know if you know Dave, David Bowie. In 97, he was still popular, but uh, even back then, his popularity was dwindling. But still, he was able to secure, not alone, you know, somebody bought out his rights, uh, his, his repertoire up to that point. An insurance company bought out his rights up to that point and in lieu of future royalties. So they paid him 55 million for his old music. He said, no problem, <laughs> take it. Because he's still making music, so they don't own the new music. <laughs> and then they, they issued bonds based on, and they used to call them Bowie bonds. So you could invest in the royalties that Bowie's music could bring in, in future royalties, because his music was being played on the radio. And sometimes we, we take for granted how much music is around us. Music in the ads, music in, on the radio, um, and, don't, uh, and don't appreciate that there's a whole mechanism behind that to make sure that for every minute that song plays, some sense go to the artist. There's a whole stream. So, well, you may be aware of some of it now that there's a battle with um, these collective management societies, but that's the, that's the bottom line. When they get this money from these Fed promoters, that money goes back to the artists, foreign or local, depending on whose music you're playing. That, that's the reason why it's there for. So let's appreciate that these, these rights have, have long, as you say in marketing, long tails. How far they generate revenue. Long after the, your sales have peaked and you've sold the CD, but the music is still being used. Okay. So that's as far as I wanted to get. I know I had time to cover today. Um, but I'm hoping that you're inspired to, to dig deeper into what you have or what you are working on or what you think you might want to develop now that you know this. And uh, I left an open invitation with um, Expo TT to, if you need us to go deeper in any given area, because each of these areas is a whole area of study by itself. Uh, this is just this is an overview. Huh? <laughs> um, but each, each area has a whole bunch of different strategies, depending on your business. So you need to ask yourself, well, what am I doing? Am I, am I into inventions or am I into designs? Am I into many brands? And if I'm exporting, I need to know how do I get information on foreign markets and, and the trading conditions over there. Because you may be look, just looking at the, at, the, at the, let's say, the health and safety requirements, but also you need to know what are, are the, the IP requirements as well. So I'm just going to end there and invite, um, thank you for your patience and invite any questions. <laughs>